Hey, it's Bear Gardner, and I am coming to you with a wrap-up video for Season 2 of Pauper's Progress, uh, my new player experience, which I called Pauper's Progress. This will be at the end of the playlist. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about it, because I think it's useful, and I've noticed that we're sort of at that time in the season that we always hit where it's really hard for new players, and I know people do tend to hit a wall, so I wanted to do a video talking about not only what is possible, but how it gets there and what the barriers might be and i figured i might as well do it as a wrap up on a season where i've kind of deliberately done the thing so uh tldr if you don't want to go back and watch everything else uh, although there is the intro to watch which is worth looking uh pulpus progress was my second season of new player content after i took a an account of field marshal from absolutely nothing free to play i decided to try and do something else that was new player you know worthwhile something that would demonstrate what you can achieve with limited resources in cards because i see an awful lot of pay to win or this game's too hard if you don't put money into it and it's well frankly it's not true I, i'm just going to say it the way i see it which is it's a factual statement it's been proved multiple times subjectively that it is you can watch it happen so anyway speaking of watching it happen we went to start this. So the idea was pretty simple. I restricted myself to what we call a pauper deck, which is to say I was not allowed to use for the whole run. I used no special or elite cards, even if I had access to them. I could only use standard or limited cards. Uh, I also decided to use my least used nation um, just because I wanted a different side of it. So we landed on Soviets, which is the nation I play least often. And we landed on, as I say, a pauper deck we were successful um you can watch every game of the run uh, there are no off uh there's there's like no off stream play like every game that was played was played on stream um you can go watch them all uh you can see the results and you can see that in less than four and a half hours we got from rank six which is where you'll drop to if you get to field marshal back to field marshal on a pauper deck so let's have a look at the deck and then we'll talk a little bit about what I think we can learn from this. But first of all, let's actually just go and see if we can take a look at the deck. Right. So this is the deck that we finished on. This is the final deck. It obviously went through some iterations. You'll see those if you go watch the videos. But in the end, this is what we ended up with. Uh, the archetype was tokens, which is to say a deck that generates light infantry. Uh, through things like reserves, which are just 1-1 one, one tokens that appear on the board. They're one cost to deploy from hand. They have no operational cost, and they have nothing interesting about them unless you add to them, which is the whole shtick of this deck. I've done a video on full-blown tokens play. This is um, much more limited because we do not have access to a lot of the big tools so lots of people if you talk about tokens will say that there are certain cards that you must have access to so we're going to switch to soviet us special and elite cards and a lot of people will say things like if you're playing tokens you need access to certain cards industrial might is high on this list as a draw engine it's a two cost card that draws a card for each unit you've deployed or added this turn it's incredibly good in tokens uh, you will also, of course, see 67th Baron of Ichi. This is an incredibly powerful card in tokens. Um, it, it, the buff is insane. Uh, the way that the buff works is crazy. You can go watch a video on that. But the, the shorthand of this is that this itself, when you deploy it, gains plus one, plus one for every light infantry that you have on the board. And afterwards, every light infantry that you deploy while this is still alive and not somehow suppressed or restricted gains plus one plus one for every alpine unit on the board so this and every other light infantry it's bonkers this is another card that people will say you need access to to play tokens um uh the last one is we can find close combat you go on the last one is close combat friendly infantry units are plus three attack until the end of the turn this is how you finish with this deck. People will tell you that this is essential to play tokens, and at a high level it is, but it is possible to play tokens without it. 
and hit field marshal and to do quite well when play some games after that and be relatively competitive without a single special or elite card i know we did it in like just under four and a half hours it was really fun this deck misses all of those things and we use a replacement so we have ancestral call as a replacement finisher it's very effective it gives us a big buff but it's tremendously expensive that is the cost of pauper decks we have easier access to this we could run as many as four not that we're going to but it's very effective uh we also have access to uh, some of the really good tools we have like no surrender but we also added in little things like shore bombardment Four cost, deal three damage to a unit, which gives us a bit of removal, or give a unit plus two plus three. It's got some utility for us. Uh, we ran uh, some M10A1. We ran a single M10A1 for a bit of suppress, which was very useful. We ran a hammer for yet more removal. And the core of the deck just remained the same as it always has done for tokens, which is we relied on reserves, uh, deep operation, line of engagement to generate and no surrender to generate the tokens and then frontal assault 503rd motors and unity is strength to buff those tokens it's a much tighter deck when you have the specials. It's a shorter deck list and you have access to much more potent tools. But with some substitutions, the deck is very, very playable at pauper. Right. Now, I'm a great believer that the proof of the pudding tends to be in like the actual results. You want to see results and that's very understandable. So I'm going to cut in a minute. Uh, and we'll come back and we'll talk about the results of the season because I can show you the results of the season. Right, here we are. So this is where we're going to have a look at how the season went. So I use a spreadsheet to track my season progress when I'm tracking my progress on sessions and seasons, which is not all of the time. It's not something I recommend you do regularly. This is not some, a video where I'm going to say you should definitely do this. This is mostly a competitive player's tool, but it's useful for dissecting this. Uh, so I went back and I went through every game that we played and entered them into a sheet, this sheet here, which shows you every single game that we played total of 41 games were played. Uh, it shows you every single result. I enter all the relevant information, my archetype and main, nation and main and a bunch of other stuff, which lets us even the names of my opponents. The key though, is that we're going to focus on insights. So these insights let us extrapolate some stuff about what it took to get what we get to. So let's cut to the fairly obvious one. We, we played 41 games. And we won 63, just just about 63% of them, which is pretty solid. Um, it, it's a strong win rate if you are a player who wants to get field marshal. Um, competitive, elite, whatever you want to call it, play. We tend to aim for 65% plus as a bare minimum. However, the being able to hit 63% on a pauper deck surprised even me. I knew from the beginning that it was possible that we were going to be able to do this, otherwise I'd never have actually signed up for it. Um, but I didn't necessarily expect that we would have a near elite win rate when doing so. And it showed a lot of interesting things for me. Um, we learned a lot about what it is like to play and have to focus. So how do you end up with a 63% win rate without access to special or elite cards and using a deck which is effectively therefore hamstrung? The answer is by really focusing on what the deck does and hard working that play in. So we can look at these insights and see different things. We can see uh, favored matchups for this and unfavored matchups for this. Uh, favored matchups for this most of them honestly which also surprised me my win rate against us is below 50 percent it's actually just over 40 percent 
which suggests that US mains and particularly frontline is very hard for tokens, but anyone who plays tokens for a while will say that that's true. It is hard, you don't have the bodies to trade effectively. Japan, uh, usually heavy aggro decks with an 80% win rate against, 75% into Soviets and 75% into Germany, so really high win rates against strong nations, nations that are accepted to be strong. Uh, Britain, 62.5. That also surprised me. I thought it was going to be much, much harder to break down a lot of Brit decks with their HQ defense gain on this, but it turns out, if you play it right, and if you focus hard, it will work. Uh, other things that you can tell you, um, there is a there is a distinct difference if we look where over we have the, um, if I actually use my mouse to point these out, although you can probably see them on the screen, over here we have our win rates. So we went first 58% of the time. Not hugely irrelevant stat, but it means that we, we went we are we were on the play more often than we were on the draw. Critically, the really interesting thing is you do learn a lot from the fact that our win rate was over 65% when we're playing, as in going first, and just short of 60% when we're going second. This is Fairly common in aggressive decks, but it's interesting to know. So, notwithstanding the fact that we can look at these stats all day and see lots of interesting things, what I mostly wanted to do was show a basic win rate and give you guys an idea of what it looked like. So you can actually, you can pause the screen, go back and pause the previous screen, which I'll, I'll shift back to be visual here. If people do want to go and pause it, you can see the list of the games that I played. You might actually be on that list. Those insights were something that informs me in making this video. Stepping back away. Um, so what this taught me and what I wanted to get across was the value of learning a deck well enough to play it competently into lots of different matchups. And I think this is something that gets missed a lot uh, when people get frustrated. Because I see lots of people getting really frustrated that they, they climb to a certain point on the ranks and you hit a wall. And it can get frustrating. And I hear a lot of concern about is it pay to win is this a paywall do i have to buy some stuff to be able to do this you definitely don't actual statement I've done it more than once i'm in fact doing it again you can catch me on tuesdays doing it all over again from rank six to field marshal on a pauper deck uh this time we're doing germany italy combined arms anyway the point being it is doable you don't need to spend money to do it what you do need to do though what you do have to spend is time and that can be the hard thing to spend. It takes effort. Putting it bluntly, um, it is a skill issue most of the time. Uh, most of the time when you're coming out of matchups, if you've spoken to people and had a look around and made sure that you've got some advice on decks and, hey, hit the cards Discord and, and tag me or any number of the other content creators, we're always happy to help and talk about decks, which is... A good place to get sources for good ideas for a good deck construction but the reality is that if you are taking for example the deck that i just showed you and you're playing it and you get to a certain point and you're not progressing nine times out of ten it isn't the deck it's just getting used to the deck and learning the nuances of the deck and accepting that sometimes we make mistakes and also not expecting too much Again, I really want to emphasize in this video that uh, what I would consider to be an elite or top level win rate is over 65%. And the very, the very best players in this game generally are somewhere between 70 and 75. That is to say, even the very best players lose almost three games in 10. I just, I think it's something that's important to know if you are a new player and you're frustrated at the fact that you're not getting it. I think sometimes the idea is that 
because it's a climbing system that somehow you need to get to 80, 90% win rates, and it's ridiculous and it doesn't happen and it's not. You want to aim to be north of 50%, preferably north of 55, is a good win rate. Really good play, you're playing well, you can be happy in yourself, unless you wish to compete or climb or do something else specific, you don't need to push yourself further than that. To get to that point, the best advice I can give you is don't hop decks. I see this happen all the time. I hit a wall, I want a new deck. Going to go and try something different because if I change the deck, I'll change my win rate and things will get better, and I've got a better chance of doing it because this deck might work better. The problem is, the majority of the time, that doesn't work because what you're actually doing is making yourself lose more because you're asking yourself to play a deck you don't know that well that you're not familiar with, and hope that somehow it's magically better, and honestly, most of the time it isn't. Now, there are exceptions to this. There are certain matchups that you turn up to. For example, if you are playing US Frontline and you queue into US Frontline and you go first, your win rate is, your ex, your likely win rate is probably north of 60%. It just is. Going first is that important in that matchup. Other matchups, like if you're Frontline queuing into tokens, you're probably in a good place because tokens has a hard job against you. If you're running a pin deck and you queue into frontline, you're probably going to win because there are some bad matchups. But on the whole, what I want to emphasize is that hopping decks is only going to dilute your skill set. Early on in the game, I definitely recommend you hop around plenty to figure out what you enjoy playing. If you look at my new player content, I give a starter deck for all five nations, which requires nothing more than that you install the game and get your nations to level 12. And your nation ranks with each of them to unlock the second deck that unlocks there. You can then build those starter decks, play those archetypes, and find out which one you like. And then you'll find that I've done follow-up videos that talk about how to improve that deck, and several of them have gone even further, and there are more coming, where I do videos on how to play those decks and tactical choices, and these are all designed for you as a new player to improve your game and get familiar with it, and it works. And the reason I say it works is I absolutely love something I've loved, which I didn't expect, is the number of messages I get from people and comments I get from people saying, hey, Thank you. I watched your videos. I tried your decks. I watched some of your streams and I learned different things. And suddenly I'm winning more because I found a deck I like. And I settled on it. And I played it and it got me to field marsh or it got me to where I wanted to get to. And that's the thing about any game we want to be fun is we shouldn't be hopping decks to try and find the deck that's going to work because, ugh, we have to play Brit, or ugh, we've got to play Control, or you've got to play Aggro. You can field marshal on most reasonably established archetypes really quite comfortably, and without necessarily needing massive access to elites and specials. There are exceptions you're not likely to be able to build a strongly competitive control deck with a limited collection because the majority of control decks use a high number of elite and special cards. But many deck archetypes, Frontline, Japan Aggro, uh, Germany Midrange, uh, Tokens, obviously, which I'm talking about here, these all don't use huge numbers of them. They're not essential. They're just icing on the cake. They make it better, and they're very important sometimes for climbing if you're aiming to climb ladder, but that's a whole different conversation. But yeah, the, I'm not going to make this a super long video. I just wanted to get down to my condensed advice that I have learned that I think is worthwhile to take away from what I've done and what I've shown, which is remember it's doable. Be nice to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Relax. If you're getting frustrated, you'll play faster because you'll be annoyed. Therefore, you'll make decisions quicker and play faster and you'll lose more. If you're getting frustrated, if you get on a two or three game losing streak, just stop playing. All of the very best players that I know do precisely this. 
get onto a streak of losers, many of them would say that at two losses, myself included, unless I'm streaming at two losses, I am immediately hopping out of the client and doing something else. Because I'm getting into a headspace where I'm expecting too much and pressuring myself, and if I'm playing too quickly, then I will lose. I also focus. If I want to achieve something, I will pick a deck, play it, and play it, and play it. Because the more I play it, the better I get with it, the better my results will be, unless the deck is flawed. If you take the advice from myself and other content creators, you won't be playing with flawed decks. I promise you we test these things. I can speak for both myself and many other content creators and cards who are good friends of mine and people who I really appreciate in my life. We test these things so you don't have to. So you can just pick them up and go, well, I can try this out and I can get some success and then I can make some changes that work for me. And that's where this game gets fun. I love this game, I love this community, and I would love to see this game grow. And I think one of the biggest barriers to growth right now is players hitting a wall and feeling like it's just not winnable or they've got to pay to win. You don't. You really don't. We're here to help you. There's loads of us here who are very, a group of us who are very happy to help drive that forward to help you get more involved in the game and progress free to play or minimal cost, or whatever you're comfortable with. If you can afford it and you like the game, of course I'm going to say you should probably throw some money 1939's way because otherwise the game will die. No game can exist forever without any financial investment, but you do not have to pay to enjoy this game. Anyway, I've waffled on for long enough. I'll probably be back for more of this. But this video was something that was just on me when I was ref when going over, when I was like kind of reviewing this run. This video was just something that was kind of on my heart, and I wanted to come out and say it and put it out there so that newer players can come and watch this and, and see what is possible. And watch some of my other streams and come see me make mistakes, because Lord knows I make enough of them. Because that's also something to remember. No matter how good a player you might be, and I'm generally accepted to be pretty decent by some very good players. We we all screw up. We all make mistakes. That's that's part of the game. But anyway, I hope this has been useful. I hope that it finds you in a place where you can get something out of it. I hope that you enjoy my content. If you do, what well, inevitably you know the deal. Like, subscribe, all of that gubbins, because if I don't feed the algorithm monsters, then this doesn't get anywhere. But point people in the direction of this too. If you've got friends who play this game and they're getting frustrated, maybe just shoot them this link. I help. Either way, be good humans and stay well.